Good, thank you. Again, I don't know if the outlines have made their way around this morning, but there is an outline for our time together in the next hour. We're looking at paragraphs six and seven of the Confession, which deal with the sufficiency and the clarity of Scripture. So if you have those outlines, if you have access to a copy of the Confession, I believe is printed in the back of your hymnal, it may be on the handouts, you may find that helpful. Sarah and I are very grateful for all that uh, this church has done to welcome us through RTS especially. I've made a number of trips to Texas, but this is Sarah's first time to Houston and to the state of Texas, so I have been uh, very interested to get her first impressions of the state of Texas. And now these are my words, not hers, but I'm condensing conversations from yesterday and today. Her, her reaction has been something along the lines of, Texans really love Texas, don't they? <laughs> that was confirmed for us this morning when she pulled at the hotel her waffle out of the waffle iron. It was shaped in the state of Texas. <laughs> and uh, South Texas, you were the first to go, I'm afraid. Well, Texans care about Texas, rightly so, and Christians care about the Bible, rightly so. And if you care about something, you want to know as much as you can about it. And that's why we're here. And we're going to look at two attributes of Holy Scripture so that we can better understand it and in better understanding the Scripture, we would better know and love the author of Scripture, God Almighty. So let's look to begin at the sufficiency of Scripture. That was introduced in paragraph one. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. And it's in paragraph six that that will be explained and worked through. There are two things to see in this paragraph. The first is the sufficiency of Scripture. And the second may be a little surprising. I've chosen a word, it's not unique to me, but it has a bit of shock value. This paragraph not only teaches the sufficiency of Scripture, but it also shows us something about the insufficiency of Scripture meaning there are some things God has not designed the Scripture to do. So we want to think about that together. So to begin, the sufficiency of Scripture, and the confession is making two claims. Positively, it's saying the Scripture is complete. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory man's salvation, faith, and life. These are all set down in Scripture. In other words, all that you need to know to glorify God, to be saved, for faith and life, faith and obedience, is set down in Holy Scripture. You don't need to go anywhere else because Scripture is incomplete. Now, notice they're not saying that there is not truth to be found outside the Bible. We saw last night that God reveals Himself in the world, and that is true. His wisdom, His goodness, His power is evident in the things that are made. But there are some things that God has not revealed in the world generally. They are found only in Scripture. And this paragraph is saying everything that you need to glorify God, everything you need to know, everything you need to do in relation to salvation, you will find in one place, and that is Holy Scripture. And then they're saying something else. 
Here's the second claim. Not only is Scripture complete, but Scripture is final, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. If in these last days God has spoken to us in His Son, we have a complete, a full, a final revelation of God in Holy Scripture, and we don't need to go, and we ought not go look elsewhere for God's verbal speech. Now, there are two targets here, new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. And the first target were groups that in the 17th century were called enthusiasts. These would be the fathers, the ancestors of the modern charismatic movement, people who were claiming ongoing revelation by the Holy Spirit, that God continues to speak to His people individually by the Spirit. And then there's the second target, and that's Roman Catholicism, traditions of men. Now, as we heard so well last hour, The confession is not rejecting creeds and confessions and standing on the shoulders of brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us in the study of Scripture. What they're saying is that those traditions are not authoritative. You cannot put them alongside Scripture. They are not the very Word of God. And that, of course, is what the Roman Catholic Church has maintained for centuries. Let tradition be a help. We're not biblicists, as Dr. Barcellus reminded us last night. We embrace all the helps we can, but God has spoken in Holy Scripture, and we add nothing to those words. So, Scripture… The Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the only rule of faith and practice. And then they go on to say what they're not saying. And this brings us to the insufficiency of Scripture. There there are some things that Scripture in God's design was not designed to do. And let's look at three examples that get brought up in this paragraph. The first is illumination the saving and lightening work of the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge, they say, the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. Notice they're, they're not saying that the Spirit is saying more words than were given in Scripture, but the Spirit is doing something by and with the Word. They're saying it's possible for you to know the content of Scripture and not be saved. You need more than just awareness of the contents of Scripture. You need more than to be able to pass a test about what Scripture says or doesn't say. You need what the confession calls a saving understanding of the Word, and that's something that only the Spirit of God can do. What does all this mean? Well, think of James in the second chapter. He says, you believe that God is one. You do well. So, pause there. You ought to believe that God is one. That is true. You don't do wrong to believe it. Do you remember what he goes on to say? Even the demons believe and shudder. The devil knows that God is one. Jonathan Edwards once wrote that the devil is the most orthodox creature in the universe. He has been studying God and His works for millennia. He is a better theologian than any individual living in the church today, but he hates what he knows. 
that knowledge will do him no good. It will add to his eternal misery. So the the content of Scripture cannot bring someone to salvation by itself. And here's where the Spirit of God comes in. The Spirit of God illumines the understanding. And what happens then? You, You take the words of Scripture, and if you've come to Christ later in life, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You have a relish. You have an appetite for the Word of God. You you love the Word of God. Your heart responds to the Word of God. Before, you were stone dead cold before the Word of God. And that's the ministry of the Spirit of God. That is His saving, illumining work, the fruit of it in your lives. So there's illumination. And then circumstances. There are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the church common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word which are always to be observed. Now what's a circumstance? Well, a circumstance is, is when, when you do something, it's a detail. It's a necessary detail. And if you don't tend to that detail, you're not going to get the thing done, or you're not going to get it done well. So, this conference. What if Grace Family Baptist Church had simply said, we're going to have a conference and nothing more? We're not going to tell you the time, we're not going to tell you the location, we're not going to tell you the speakers, no arrangements. You're not going to have a conference. But that's not what the planners did. They have done so well in ordering all the details to make this conference happen. And it's the same way the confession says, in the worship of God, and the government of the church. Think of Pastor Balcom's example last hour. We are to worship the Lord as the church on His day. Now, is that 11 o'clock in the morning? Is that 9.30 in the morning? Is it 8 o'clock in the morning? You don't have chapter and verse to tell you. God has given it to the leadership of the church in wisdom and prudence to make those decisions. Or the government of the church. We have elders in the church. We have elders in the church because God in the Bible says elders are to lead the church. But how many elders should we have? What are the procedures that we use to to nominate and to elect them? Again, circumstances that are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the Word. Now, this is a biblical principle. You remember in 1 Corinthians 14, and what a mess the Corinthians had made of worship. It was absolute chaos. And so Paul is writing the church in Corinth, and he's, he's trying to set some order into a very disorderly assembly. And he gives some principles, but then he steps back and he gives them some general guiding principles. 1 Corinthians 14 at verse 26, let all things be done for edification. We're then at verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. What has sometimes been called the Presbyterian life verse. Let all things be done decently and in order. So that's how circumstances are to work. They're to be done in submission to the principles of Scripture. But there's some details 
that God has not legislated in his word. So we have illumination, we have circumstances, and then there's human reasoning. God has given us a book. God has made us after his image. So we are speaking, knowing creatures. To put it simply, God gave you a brain, and he expects you to use your brain. When we say human reasoning, we don't mean reasoning that stands over God, that tells God what is or isn't, what we may or may not do. But this is reasoning that submits to God. But reasoning still functions. And that's something we have to do when we come to Scripture. All they're saying is use the minds that God gave you. And we could think of two examples. One is mentioned in this paragraph. The whole counsel of God is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture, which is another, and I take it, equivalent way of saying what the original Westminster Standards had said, by good and necessary consequence, may be deduced from Scripture. And as we heard last hour, you have to have inferences, deductions. The Trinity is not a word you will find in the Bible. You will not find the Trinity stated in a single verse. Does that mean the Trinity is not biblical? Of course not. It is biblical because we take the statements of Scripture and we put them together and we say we have no choice but to confess God is one in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, not just any inferences, they are necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture. This is something that is demonstrably certain, as one has put it. And they are authoritative. As one of your own prophets, Sam Waldron, has written, what may be by sound logic deduced from Scripture, that is to say what is necessarily contained in it, has the authority of Scripture. That's why we don't take a live and let live approach towards the Trinity. Well, it's okay if you believe it, but if you don't. No, this is a biblical teaching. It is something you must embrace as a Christian. And remember, all we're saying is that you are not putting something into Scripture, you are drawing out of Scripture what God has put there. Now, an example may help, because this is something we see in the Bible itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You remember 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is trying to help the Corinthians think through how to live as Christians in, a, in an ungodly world. The Corinthians haven't been doing so well in that department. There have been a few too many concessions to the world. And then there are others who were erring in the opposite extreme. So Paul lays down a principle in chapter 10 at verse 25 and 26. He says, here's the principle, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. What's the issue? Some of that meat had been prepared in idol temples. And after it was used, it was put out in the marketplace, and it was being sold. Now, this, this was top-flight meat, and it was cheap. This was the Sam's Club or Costco of Corinth. It was good stuff. And Paul says, don't, don't raise questions of conscience. Now, there's some other things that he says. We don't need to go into them here and now, but that's the principle in verse 25. And then he gives his reason in verse 26. He's quoting Scripture. Here's the 24th Psalm. 
For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, now what does that have to do with eating meat in Corinth? Well, look at what Paul has done. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. A good God has made this world. And we know that the works of the Lord's hands are good because a good God is not going to make an evil world. And that means you and I cannot look at something God has made and pronounce it sinful in itself. If God made that piece of meat, it's good. And it would be sin for me to call it evil. Now, Psalm 24 doesn't say that in so many words. But Psalm 24 says it. What Paul has done is he has thought through, let me think about what it means that a good God has made a good world. And then he comes to the only conclusion he can, eat whatever's sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. There's an example of how we're to use our minds when we come to the Scripture, drawing out those inferences that God has set there. Now, there's a second example, and that's application. And we do this so often, we sometimes don't stop to think about what we're doing. What do we do when we apply the Scripture? We are are taking a command, a principle given us in the Scripture, We're we're looking at the facts or the situation that's in front of us, and we're connecting the two, and we draw a conclusion. And that conclusion is, this is what God wants me to do here. Now, here's the remarkable thing. I have looked at any number of translations of Scripture. I have consulted as many concordances as I can find. And you correct me, but I have yet to find the name Guy Waters located anywhere in the Bible. It's just not there. Now, does that mean that God is not speaking to me? Does that mean that I am under no obligation before Scripture? Of course not. Thou shalt not steal doesn't say Guy Waters shall not steal. So, do I have a blank check to go steal? Of course not. What I do is I say, I ask, do I belong to that group of people to whom God says, you shall not steal? And I answer the only way that I can, of course. Therefore, I shall not steal. But there are other commands. I read the command, wives, submit to your husbands. Well, I'm not a wife. I'm never going to be a wife. So that command doesn't apply to me the way that it applies to others. Or what about when Paul says, slaves, obey your masters? Well, I'm not a slave. None of us here is. But I am an employee. I'm under authority in the marketplace, so there is some application for me there. Or when Paul writes the Thessalonians, brothers, pray for us. You and I know we are to apply that command. Raise your hand if you've ever prayed for the Apostle Paul. Of course you haven't. Paul's in glory. He doesn't need our prayers. We're not to pray for or to the dead. But you know to apply that by praying for those who preach the Word of God. Now, notice we we gave a number of examples, and none of these require degrees to figure out. You're doing this all the time, but what are you doing? You're taking the Scripture, you're taking the principles, you're thinking through your situation, and you're applying them to your situation. You're applying those principles to where you are. And then there are Proverbs. Just take one example. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. Answer not a fool 
according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. All right, clear enough. Answer not a fool according to his folly. But then, what does the very next verse say? Answer, yeah, that's right, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, which is it? Do I do it or do I not do it? And the answer is yes. The point is you've got to figure out what kind of fool you have before you. Is this a fool not worth talking to or is this a fool who needs a talking to? And that's going to take wisdom. You've got to apply the general principles of Scripture to that situation and decide what's going to be best. And that's not dishonoring to God. That's honoring to God because that's the way that He made you. And this is the book that He gave you. And if you're doing it in dependence upon Him, in prayer and in humility, and with careful study and by taking counsel from other believers, then you're doing what God has called you to do. So to summarize the sufficiency of Scripture, Scripture is sufficient. It is enough for the purposes for which God has given it the only rule of faith and obedience. As Paul wrote Timothy, verses we read last hour, the Word of God is complete. It is adequate. It is sufficient to make you adequate in good works. But even in those areas about which Scripture does not speak, Scripture doesn't tell me how to repair a carburetor. Scripture doesn't tell me how to speak the French language. But it does tell me whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And in that way, Scripture guides the way I repair a carburetor or I learn to speak French. All of life is lived in submission to Scripture. So there's the sufficiency of Scripture. And then we come in the next place to the clarity of Scripture, and that's in paragraph 7. The word that's often used, a more technical word, is the perspicuity of Scripture. Now, if sufficiency answers the question, has God given us everything we need in the Bible? And we've seen how the confession answers that. Then clarity answers, is what God has given us in the Bible clear? As as Waldron notes in his commentary, if the Bible is not clear, it doesn't matter if it's sufficient or not. It may be full and complete, but if you can't understand it, it's no good to you. Now, what's the historical background to what the Confession says about clarity? The historical background is the Roman Catholic Church. Rome insists that the Scripture is so opaque and dark to the average Christian that it is dangerous to put the Bible in the hands of ordinary Christians. That's why when William Tyndall translated the Bible into English, he lost his life. It was a radical thing in his day at the Reformation. And they said the Bible is so, is so opaque that they're going to need the church, they're going to need the experts to tell them what it means. If you're a Christian, all you need to know is that the church has figured out the Bible. The church knows what the Bible says. You don't even have to understand the church's teaching. You just have to trust on the credit of the authority of the church that they've got it right. And the confession takes that apart, root and branch. And they're very careful in the way they do it. 
They don't overreact. So, is Scripture clear? And if it is, how is it clear? And here's, here's the answer in a word. Scripture is clear, essentially clear, in the matters that are most basic to its message. So, let's look at what they say. Scripture is basically clear in the matters that are essential to its message. Now, they give some qualifications here. All things in Scripture, they say, are not alike plain in themselves. Now, that, that's a pretty weighty statement. Where did they get that idea from? Well, they got it from the Apostle Peter. Second Peter chapter 3 at verse 16. He's, he's commenting about the letters of Paul, and he pauses and he says, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Now, you kind of wish Peter had maybe taken a couple more lines and told us what some of those things might be. But in God's wisdom, he didn't. We're content with that. It is enough to know there are some things in Paul that are hard to understand, and we have that on the authority of an apostle. There are things in Paul that are inherently deep and difficult and hard. The confession also says, nor alike clear unto all. Something may be clear to you, it's not clear to me. Why is that? Well, one reason is that some of us have been studying the Bible longer than others. We've just borne more fruit in our work than others. If you've only been reading the Bible a year, you're probably not going to understand it as well as a Christian who has carefully studied the Scripture for 25 years. And then, of course, there's sin. One of the sad effects of sin is that it, it blinds us, it prompts us to twist the words of God to mean what they don't say. So, remember Peter in 2 Peter 3.16, he says, what, what do some do with those hard things in Paul? The ignorant and the unstable twist them to their own destruction. So, Scripture is not equally clear. It is not equally clear to all. And then they say, in a due use of ordinary means. The way you're going to understand what Scripture says is by the use of means, ordinary means not an infallible church, so-called, not private revelations, but the ordinary means, the means of grace, particularly the reading and the preaching of the Word of God. Teachers help us to understand what God has said, and that's the way God wants it. You remember in Acts 8, there is the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's on this long trek from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. It's about a thousand miles. And there he is on his chariot, and he's, he's been to the feast, and he's studying the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And here comes Philip. And I love this exchange. Philip is bold. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch says, well, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And then Philip took that portion of Scripture, and he, he showed him Jesus from that Scripture. Now, Philip was not Lord over the eunuch's conscience. He was helping him to see what was there. You, you remember when the Apostle Paul came to Berea in Acts 17, and there's Paul, and he's preaching Jesus from the Scripture. And they're the Bereans, and they're, they're listening to what Paul has to say, and they go home. 
And they're opening up their Scriptures, and they're comparing what Paul said against what the Scripture says. Is this guy right? Is this guy for real? And that's the way it's supposed to work. God gifts His church with teachers. You you receive what they say, but only if you can say this is, yes, what God has said in His Word. And that's the way God brings us to greater clarity about His Word. And that's why we need not just pastors and elders, but we need sound ways to interpret the Bible, as, as we heard last night. That's why we, we don't reject, but we embrace commentaries, works of exposition, to help us understand what God has said. So, Scripture is essentially clear with those three qualifications. Now, let's ask two more questions. What is clear? Now, look at the way the confession puts it. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or other. So there are some things in Scripture that you must know and believe for salvation. And those things are clear. Now, you see this in the New Testament, don't you? You remember the church in Rome. And you've got in chapter 14 and 15, Paul is talking about the strong and the weak. And there's some differences over the observance of days and the eating of foods. And and Paul says, now, I, I think you strong ones are right but I want you to bear with your weak brothers. And weak brothers, I want you to bear with your strong brothers. But then the Apostle John, he's writing to the church. You got people who are saying that Jesus Christ was not a true human being. And John does not say, just try to live together. Live with those differences doesn't matter if Jesus Christ was a human being or not. He's very clear. You don't believe Jesus Christ is a human being. Don't call yourself a Christian. This this is essential. This is fundamental. We cannot agree to disagree within the church about this. Now, to whom is it clear? And look at the way the confession puts it, that not only the learned but the unlearned may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. Not that you'll learn everything there is to know about them. You'll you'll have a sufficient understanding. You'll know enough. And not only the learned, but the unlearned. God didn't write this book so that you need an advanced degree to understand what this book is about. Now, philosophers and scientists and theologians have poured over the Scripture. That is a credit to the wisdom of God that it has such depths. But God has written this book in a way that if you don't have that learning or training, you can read this book, and and with the helps God has given you, you can understand what it's about. It's often attributed to Augustine, but no one can seem to find where in his writings it is. But it is a statement he is supposed to have said about the Gospel of John. He said, John is like a pool in which a child can wade and an elephant can swim. That's true of all Scripture, isn't it? The simplest child can understand its basic message. And yet there are depths that will transcend the understanding of the most learned and degreed scholar. 
But in the matters that matter most, what we need to know for salvation, all kinds of people through means by the grace of God can embrace them and obey them for salvation. And you know, if that doesn't happen, not a soul is going to stand before God on the day of judgment and say it's your fault. There's a problem with your book because there will be no fault pinned on God. The fault will be on us. So to close, a word or two of application. Isn't it good to know that the Bible is sufficient for faith and practice? Do we believe that? not just for matters of doctrine, not just for issues that come up in the worship and government of the church, as important as those things are, but as we have issues thrown at us as Christians, in vitro fertilization, transgender, intersex issues, end-of-life issues. Christian, you have what you need in the Word of God to think through those in a way that will glorify God and to serve God. There is nothing that will come up in this world where you will say, I wish God had something to say about it, but I'm just going to have to go somewhere else. And that is a good place to be. God never puts you in a place where He has not given you guidance. Now, that means you've got to use the helps that God has given you. And that means we've got to burrow down and commit ourselves to the hard work of studying God's Word. Laziness is not a Christian virtue. We're we're to press on. We're to persevere. And isn't that true in life generally? The best things come through hard work and perseverance. And that means we have to be under a sound ministry of the Word. And that means we have to commit to putting ourselves and our families under that sound ministry of the Word. Every Lord's Day. I have mixed feelings about the work of George Barna's group, but at least they tell us what's going on. And in a recent survey from last year, and this is telling, he defined a churched person, a churched person as someone who attended a Sunday service within the last six months. According to the poll, that's a churched person. What's a practicing Christian? According to the poll, a practicing Christian is someone who attends church once a month. Those are pretty low standards. That's a pretty low bar. And if we want to be strong Christians, and if we want to see strong churches, we've got to be in the Word all the way committing ourselves to the hard work of studying, meditating, and applying it. And then finally, I wonder if you've ever spoken, perhaps with a non-Christian, and you're trying to share with them the, the basic message of the Bible, and, and you, get, you get the reply. I've heard it. I'm sure you've heard it. Well, that's just your interpretation. That's just your interpretation. If that's the way you read it, great. I'm not going to read it that way. What do we say to that? I love the way Martin Luther put it. He said, the Holy Spirit is not a skeptic. What we have in the Bible, which the Holy Spirit has authored, is in the matters of deepest concern to it, crystal clear that we are ruined 
in Adam and by our own sin. That Jesus Christ, by his obedience, death, and resurrection, has redeemed sinners from every tribe, tongue, people, and race. And the Holy Spirit applies that work, regenerating dead sinners, uniting them to Jesus Christ for justification, adoption, sanctification, and glorification. People can put others off indefinitely. Well, that's just your interpretation. But at the end of the day, on that day, each of us, every human being is going to have to stand before God and he will say, I have, I have revealed myself. I've revealed myself in the Word, and I've spoken these words of Scripture. What have you done with them? And it'll never be an issue of clarity. N no man, woman, or child will say it, it wasn't clear. Have you, have I come to terms with the basic meaning of God's words, and have we responded to them? We can't without the help of His grace, but that's the good news of this word. He gives grace. Well, God grant that on that day we may stand before Him with the help of His grace in appreciation, everlasting appreciation and love for His word. That's our hope. That's our refuge. It's what God has said. And it's unchanging. And it's what we need. It's all we need. And in the things that matter most, it's clear. What a, what a good God we serve. Thank Him by devoting yourself afresh to the study of His Word. Let's pray. Our God and Father, how good it is to turn our minds for these moments to the kind of word that you have given us and to rehearse some of its great truths. We thank you that many of us can remember when the light came on by the ministry of your Spirit and how our hearts burned inwardly as your word was being read, as we embraced it and received it. And by your grace, we continue to do so, believing it and obeying it, not with sinless perfection, but with all that we're able to muster. And Father, we, we praise you that others of us cannot remember a day when we did not trust your word with faith, when we have not striven to walk with you in all the ways appointed in your word. What a blessing. Father, we pray that we would continue on these paths. We didn't put ourselves here. You did. And we can't keep ourselves here, but you can. And you said that you will through Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen.